This week on Quality Digest Live, Barb Cleary of PQ Systems joins us to look back at her career in quality. Plus, the influence of customer, customer reviews. That and more when we come back. And welcome back to Quality Digest Live for October 26, 2018. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. Uh, last week, we got an email from one of our viewers mm -hmm. asking that we cover something green. Do a, do a green story, some sort of something that ties into the environment and, and whatnot. And I ran across this headline on BBC mm. that I thought was interesting. Young couples trapped in car dependency. Mm. Okay. Interesting. So what it talks about, and we see it here in the United States, we see it here a lot in California, but probably anywhere where the populace is spread out in a mm. lot of you know rural areas, right? So what's going on in the UK, this was a UK story, is that there's a lot of developments that go up uh, on outskirts of town along major roads, with you know, ringways or motorways mm -hmm. and so forth. And what happens, and, and they're there because it, it provides kind of uh, entry level housing for maybe young couples, right? Sure. The problem is, if you want to go to the store, you get in your car and you get on the freeway and drive to the store. Yeah. When you take your kids to the school, you get in your car, get on the freeway, drive them to school. Anything you're going to do, you get in your car, get on the freeway and drive to school because there's absolutely zero services, uh, retail or any other kind of services, near these developments. Now, what this causes, obviously, is number one, it's a fair amount of stress. You, you, you're moving to your new home, that's awesome, but now mm. you're finding all your time spent in your car because absolutely anything you have to do involves driving. Uh, so it's kind of stressful, but also if you think about it, it's not good for the environment. Mm -hmm. So you're doing all this excess driving just to run small little errands. And also it leads to congestion on the freeway, so it adds to traffic and mm -hmm. so forth. So they're really studying this in the UK and trying to come up with some sort of solution to this. And the obvious solution is that when developers build towns, they actually build them with people in mind, not just for homes, right? And, and or, or as they say, don't build it with the car in mind, build it with the people in mind. And so they're actually developing communities now that have like a town square as part of the development where you can have retail space, you can have a, you know, a, a store, a retail store, you know, grocery store, mm -hmm. uh, you can have a pub or a bar, you can have a restaurant, you can have a retail area that's more kind of like a central square, like you might get in a town that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, organically grown, right? Mm -hmm. But this is, they're actually being built this way in some yeah. areas. And it makes a lot of sense because again, if you're keeping the customer in mind, in this case the customer is the house buyer, they want more than a house, they really want a community. And a community involves being able to do something like walk downtown to, uh, to get a, you know, a, a pint of beer at the pub or to do your grocery shopping yeah. or to have schools right there, not mm. constantly be driving. So yeah. this is kind of an environment story. It's a green story, but it's also a customer story. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, <laughs> you, say, you say that and I'm like thinking, well, I live in California, so I know <laughs> all about getting all in your car yeah, and exactly, doing anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, California probably was, in some <laughs> Sense is kind of the the first area that really had this issue right. where because Californians don't like to build up Californians don't like multi-level dwellings they like to right. spread out so you have a lot of places that are like kind of remote and they don't have yeah. really a city center you just need to drive everywhere so that's an issue with California uh, here in our town in Chico we are seeing more of these intentional communities um, okay. kind of these cultured communities that you, you talk about that didn't really grow organically so much but are now being developed with mixed use in mind, you know, where you have people that would have, like you say, would have retail, would have some, some apartment buildings, would have some single family dwellings, would have some, uh, you know, some, some restaurants and, and entertainment, um, all within biking or walking distance. So you can get away from having to use the car all the time. It makes a lot of sense. It, it also makes sense for the, for the happiness of, of your consumer, if you think about it. I mean, I, uh, you know, living in Chico, which is a smaller city, but it's still a city, I have to drive to work. When right. I come here to the studio, I drive. Um, 
there have been times where I've been able to bike to, to my, my work sure. here in town, which has been great. It's great. Yep. It's awesome, yep. you know. Um, it just makes your whole day different. When you go in in the morning and you've biked in and now you're, you're, you've got a little exercise, you're feeling great, you weren't cooped up in your car listening to Rush Limbaugh, which is <laughs> depressing to begin with. But um, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it's a whole different element of, of right. getting your day started. And then going home after that, you know, you bike home or you walk up. I mean, it, it's, it's the way life used to be and yeah, maybe it's cultured as opposed to organic. Right. But I think it's the way more people probably want to live their life. And, well, and, and, and you mentioned you mentioned mixed use. We're even seeing this a lot more in developments in town too, where rather than just have an apartment building, and you know other, and then you have your other businesses, where you're seeing more. And in Sacramento, quite a bit of this is going on. Is you know, kind of the lower level is shops, mm -hmm. and then right above the shops is you know, uh, um, uh, you know, lim uh, yeah. you know uh, condos yeah. or apartments yeah. or or whatnot. And it's kind of that same idea. What you see a lot, I think, on on the East Coast, uh, certainly in Europe, is where everything is within within walking distance. And in California, that's really a strange. You're right. We're not used to walking everywhere. No. But I mean, this is I, I, like I, said, I I like this story because it's both an environmental issue and it's also a a customer issue. When a developer is building a development, they should be looking at more than just building homes. That's important. You know, affordable housing is important. But you're, you you got to look at the entire experience because that's also going to attract buyers. Yeah. If you can attract them to a place that not only are we giving you a home that you can afford because it's on the outskirts of town, but we're also giving you an environment where you feel you feel like you're in a town. You feel like you're in a community. Well, and you know, this, it's interesting. This pendulum has swung here in America, for instance, and maybe in Europe too, but certainly here in America, where you know you kind of go back and forth between the urban and the suburban. Uh, life, you know, rural kind of stays the way it is in many cases, but, right. you know, people were, you know, initially, you know, 100 years ago, everybody, many people lived in these cities, right? And in the urban cores, you'd have a, you know, a million people living within, you know, a couple dozen blocks in lower Manhattan, right? <laughs> right, right low, exactly, low yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you know, then there was this fleeing away from that, and, and then you know, the, the urban cores got hollowed out, and there was a lot of, of empty storefronts and, and yeah. the like, and people want to live in the suburbs. Now people are saying, well, the suburbs ain't all they're cracked up to right, be. Right. You know, the millennials really do enjoy city living many times because there's so much there. There's to so do. much vibrancy to things to yeah. do. There's art and there's music and there's there's food and there's all within walking distance. All within or, walking, you get or, it, or, or, or biking. Or, yeah. or biking or public transportation. Yeah. I mean, yep. you talk about Europe. I mean, they do a great job in Europe of public transportation smokes, that we, yeah. we don't yeah. uh, here in America. People in America like their cars. Yeah. Um, and when it ties into the green thing about, well, you know, what are we doing to contribute to these problems we're having? If, if indeed the problems that we're having with, uh, with, with um, um, climate change have right. to do with carbon, um, you know, yeah, you should try to drive less, right? You I mean, but less. you try to drive less anyway, because it's better for your body and it's better for your pocketbook, <laughs> right? right? Exactly. I mean, when gas is four dollars a gallon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's better, and, and you want to walk anyway, or you yeah. want to ride your bike. I mean, it yeah. keeps your belly down and keeps your pocketbook fat. So I mean, it's 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 a good thing all around, regardless of how you feel about climate change, to try to drive less if you can. Right. And that's what I think this story is all about. And, uh, Thanks to uh, Carl DePolt for, yeah. uh, so hey, if you have ideas for stories you want us to cover, just go ahead and email them uh, yeah. to us at qdl at qualitydigest.com. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to try to do this every week where we do a little rip from the headline yep. story where, where we just kind of throw one at each other. So yeah, send this okay. to us. All right. Well, any of you watching this show today would surely agree that quality people are, well, quality people. There we go. Right? <laughs> quality people are quality people, right? Uh, and that little truism, I think, is... Uh, very much uh, embodied by the guest who is going to be joining us here in a few moments. Now, our industry isn't known for being particularly changeable or, or fast moving, uh, but if you cast your mind back to the mid 1980s, you'll recall that the world of quality was entirely different at that point in time. Uh, there was no Baldrige Award, for one thing, right? right. Uh, there was no ISO 9001, there was no Six Sigma. Document control basically meant updating your binders throughout <laughs> your facility, making sure everybody had the right, the right version. Yeah. And W. Edwards Deming was still terrifying CEOs from sea to shining sea. And in real living color, that's right. Everybody, everybody remembers that. Well, much has changed since then, but one thing that's remained the same until very recently was the presence of Barbara Cleary as PQ Systems, of PQ Systems as an industry thought leader and one of those quality people that I mentioned earlier. She recently announced her retirement from PQ Systems after a 34-year career helping run the company, which she founded with her late husband, Michael Cleary. Joining us now to chat about her impressive and far-reaching career, we're pleased to welcome Barb Cleary to our show. Barb, thanks for joining us on Quality Digest Live. Thanks so much. It's nice to be here. It's our pleasure. So, Barb, as, as uh, 
as Mike alluded to there, uh, you've been in this business for a really long time. You've been <laughs> at PQ for a long time. You've seen a lot of changes in quality. What would you say has changed the most, in your opinion, the quality industry since uh, since you got started in it? I would say the obvious thing is the, the change in technology. Certainly, the access to data and the amount of data that's available out there uh, makes um, monitoring processes and improving them uh, different in any case, uh, better in most cases. Uh, but certainly, if you think back about the days when uh, before PCs, I mean, our our headline pro product, uh, SQC Pack, was developed on what was really the only personal computer available, on uh, an Apple at that time. Uh, so it was very rudimentary technology available to even look at processes. And certainly that's changed dramatically over the years. We have lots more data, lots more challenge as far as understanding data and transforming it into real information. Uh, so certainly that's changed. I think um, the way we do business has changed because, partly because of the technology. I mean, we at PQ Systems used to have a 20,000 foot production warehouse where we packaged up our software and our print documentation, uh -huh. mailed it to people, and we, we no longer have that. We um, Most of our products are downloaded directly. Um, we are available on disk, which is sent easily through the mail. Uh, so the way we go about uh, providing our customers with our service is is different, and I think that's true for all business. The way um, the the way people see the quality is frequently through the customer uh, experience directly. You talked before about uh, serving the customer in British suburbs, uh, which would be also true in this country. Looking at the customer and seeing what really the needs are, those needs have changed. And I think the way we approach quality has to change as well o o over the years, and it has, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the Baldrige Award and others, the, the whole standards, uh, there were standards in the beginning, but um, again, rudimentary and uh, not easily understood. And I think most companies and organizations that are interested in improving quality now see that they need to conform to some kind of standards, whether it's uh, professional standards in their industry or federal regulations or uh, whatever, but um, it's important that they um, establish their quality and maintain uh, certification through right. with those standards. And w within all those changes, Barb, uh, how would you say that the mission of PQ Systems changed to adapt to those changing realities? What, what, In terms of how you relate to your customers and how you serve your customers, how has PQ Systems changed over that course of time? Our mission basically has remained the same. Our language changes over the years, as language tends to do. But really, we've always been here to serve our customers and help them improve their processes. The way we go about it is quite different now than it was 30 or more years ago. Um, but it, we really have the customers in mind and ways in which we can help them not only improve their processes, but also document it so they can show it, it proof of uh, in, in proof, proof of uh, examination of their quality and improvement. Um, so certainly um, PQ is serving the same customers the same um, in many of the same ways. We believe deeply that our customers, if they need help, we need to be accessible to them. That's always been the case. We have not changed. We don't have dials. Press one, press to press 43 when you dial PQ systems, you're gonna get a real person. Thank We've you. always been committed to, to that kind of interaction with our customers. Because I think um, it's always been important to us to know who our customers are, to know, to know them, to know what their needs are and what their dreams are, and uh, to help them uh, aspire to and reach those dreams. So we need to talk to them. They need to talk to us. So, Barbara, in, in addition to your your uh, your career with, with and your important role with PQ Systems, um, which you just retired from, as we mentioned, um, you're also a teacher um, and, and you're a former member of the Board of Education in your in your municipality. Um, so, from that rather unique vantage point, I think, um, between industry and teaching, what can you tell us about the way that we're um, preparing, or maybe that we're not preparing, our young people? to take advantage of the opportunities that exist in, in the workplaces of tomorrow. 
if we look at opportunities in the quality profession, uh, certainly young people need to be prepared with not only keen thinking skills and ability to be uh, to have analytical and critical thinking applied to it in a variety of ways. They have to have some skill levels that maybe we didn't anticipate 30 or 40 years ago. They really need to understand statistics, which is um, not frequently taught except um, as part of maybe a math department offering. Um, they need to have statistical understanding. They also need to know that education for any profession is no longer an acquisition of information and knowledge about that profession. Education really is uh, provides an opportunity for them to learn how to address new problems and new challenges because things as we know are changing very very quickly have been and will continue to and the students in our schools now need to be prepared for changes and to anticipate a world that they really don't know right now so you could it would be like plopping someone down in the middle of a library and expecting them to figure out everything that is going on there no they have to have skills that will help them sort through uh, the information that they're bombarded with every day of their lives uh, and, uh, and understand how to make decisions based on the data that's available and their understanding of that data. So I think schools need to be providing skills, understandings, and knowledge that prepare young people to really think and anticipate change and be innovative and be creative and um, live in the future. That's interesting. I mean, so, and, and we actually hear this talked a lot uh, about over the last few years is critical thinking because more and more information comes from the internet, uh, both good information and not so good information. So do you feel like, do you feel like the educational system is helping equip today's people who are coming up through the educational system to to be a critical thinker to look you know how do you parse what is real information versus uh, uh, versus fallacy you know how do you how do you uh, you know how do you read something and understand how to find a primary source and where is this coming from do you, do you feel like that's being emphasized in any way now to, to help to help today's uh, uh, young young people well, I think it is being emphasized today in many places. It's hard to generalize about the education system because it is, in fact, lots of different systems. Um, and I think as far as understanding how to sort through information, how to find things, how to discern um, the, the credible from the not so credible, um, are, are skills that many schools are really insisting on. And part of it is by giving students opportunities for their own decision making about their learning, uh, making decisions about um, what topics they're going to pursue, for example, in an um, analytical paper or what kind of projects they might undertake. And the more kind of hands-on opportunities that they have, the more they see how decisions are made in different ways and um, they, they learn how to um, anticipate challenges and address them when they emerge. So I, I do think a lot of many schools, many school systems are doing that. Unfortunately, I think the move to rigid standards in many states uh, undercuts that. It does not really allow for creativity and problem solving that, for example, is offered in um, humanities, in art and music, uh, designing and solving problems that um, may not be real world problems in the sense of the profession that they eventually go into, but help them develop their minds to, to anticipate problems and solve them. Right, right. Well, finally, as, uh, as, you, as you retire now from, from PQ Systems, um, I wonder, wh what advice would you leave us with um, in terms of the importance, the meaning of the quality profession uh, now, in, in the past and now, and, and what you foresee the meaning of that's going to be in the future as well? I wish I could see the future, but what I really, <laughs> I would really like to guess at it, and I'd like to have, I'd like to have uh, something to say about what the future brings. But I would say that the big change in recent years that can that will go forward is, I think people are much more ready to see really good customer service. That when things are standardized to the point that we are no longer 
human beings, but just maybe numbers and uh, not seeing for the needs that we really have, uh, we, we lose something um, in, in humanity, but we also lose something in terms of quality. And the quality of that interface, I think, is something that will continue to be um, emphasized ev even more. People need authentic, uh, sometimes one-to-one -one relationships in, in when they make, for example, purchasing decisions or uh, whatever. And I, I, I think maybe organizations are, are going to begin to realize this and establish quality at the customer interface uh, as, as a, a, an important um, design function. Well, Barbara Cleary, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for for uh, for years of, of great support of Quality Digest Absolutely. and, and oh, some yeah. really great yeah. articles and information you shared with our, our readers over the years too, and with us. So thanks, thanks so much for joining us today on, on Quality Digest Live, and and I'm sure we'll be we'll be seeing you down there down the line. And, you, and you're continuing you're continuing to teach. I understand, yeah. right? Yes, I am. I'm continuing to teach. We'll <laughs> wow. See how that goes. <laughs> but yeah, it's been it's been great working with you guys. I I think you're. Um, the, the publication that you distribute is really high quality and, and offers challenges in thinking and innovation that I, I think will contribute to continued quality performance throughout the profession. Oh, well, well, thank that you. That is very, that. very kind of you, and yeah. I, I would like to hope that you can continue to write for us as your time permits. We would welcome that, your, your wisdom Absolutely. going forward as well. So, Barbara, thanks, thanks again for joining us. You're welcome. Okay, thank so you. long. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Uh, all right, bye-bye. <laughs> bye. So long career in quality, yeah. and I think she told me before the show she has been a teacher mm -hmm. at the same school uh -huh. for 45 years. Yeah, yeah. Wow. She was on the board of education at that, in that of, district in, in, yeah. as well. Yeah. So really, wow. a lot of a lot of really good information. I really like what she said about how we're 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 teaching people to succeed. Uh, right. in, in the world of tomorrow, because I think that's really important. She's got a great perspective on that, yeah. being in industry, seeing industry, and seeing education as well. And she also brought up, I mean, boy, we could talk about this yeah. for her, but she also brought up a, 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 a good point about the problem with, <laughs> this is a hot issue, but the problem about teaching to standards. Well, on, on, one, on, on one hand, you can say, well, you, you, it helps set a level, but on the other hand, if you're teaching to a standard, then you're teaching by rote, yeah. and you're kind of stealing away from, from creative thinking, from uh, uh, you know, synthesis, yeah. and, and everything else that you need, critical thinking, but in you, order to s solve problems. Teachers also need to manage, manage well, classrooms, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's a balance. It's, so. it's, it's, yeah. it's a tough issue. Yeah, yeah. All right, so do you ever read reviews like if you're going on a trip, uh, yeah, yeah. like so, TripAdvisor, trip or Advisor Yelp, or, or, or something like those, that, yep, or yep. Google, Google reviews as yeah, well. All that, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was an interesting article uh, on the value of reviews to the value of reviews to readers mm -hmm. in the article "Perfect Information: Customer Reviews That Influence Purchasing Decisions," written by Tom Van Lair. Everybody loves a story. Look at that subject. Everybody <laughs> loves a story, exactly, and that's the gist of this article was about research done by Van Lair and his colleagues about what makes a good review. What do people like? And surprisingly, what makes a good review, meaning one that readers think is useful, is how the review is written. In particular, does it tell a story? Is there a narrative yeah. to it? So, you know, uh, uh, you know, this place is awesome or this place sucks, it's, it, it has little value yeah. to people. They know what you felt about it, but they don't know why, and they don't know the context. And savvy right. reader, I know you do the same thing when I when I read reviews, is that doesn't tell me why they thought it was so great or why they mm -hmm. thought it was so awful. And without a context, a review was right. almost is almost meaningless, yes. right? It has very little. It has very little value. So what Van Lair says is that the most useful reviews are those that transport the reader by conveying a sense of who and where and when. Those are the most useful. And Van Lair and his colleagues uh, did this really interesting study. They analyzed almost 200,000 reviews mm -hmm. from the things to do in Las Vegas category on the travel related uh, review site uh, TripAdvisor. So you, mm -hmm. you can, if you go on there, you can say, uh, you've probably done that, things to do in wherever I'm at, yeah, right? right. And right. TripAdvisor will come up when there'll be all these reviews on mm -hmm. different things. So they used a computer algorithm to show the relationship between combinations of words used mm. in the review and the helpfulness of the reviews as measured by reader ratings. Now some of you see that. Okay. You, you look at a review and a, a rating will be, itself will be yeah, reviewed. Was this helpful? Well, was it helpful yeah, or not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
They found that the more a review offered insight into the reader's state of mind, mm. the greater its helpfulness. How do you know a reader's state of mind? If the, re if the reviewer basically writes a story, there's a narrative, right? It, he, he's saying this is what happened. A good review also starts with a punchline or the takeaway and then tells the story. So in essence, a good piece of, uh, a good review is really journalism. For those of you who might be familiar with this, kind of the standard journalism model is what they call the inverted pyramid. Mm -hmm. Most important fact up on top, the very first sentence says, you know, man bites dog. Right. That's the punchline. Yeah. And then the rest of it is the story of a decreasing importance in, in facts as you go around. And we and call that the inverted pyramid. And those, of, uh, those who aren't in the media business don't know that was designed by AP or UPI so they could cut they, they could cut at they any point. To. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Depending on the length they need it, so you got the most information. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Top. If you yeah. design it that way, you can you can cut it to length anywhere you want. Anywhere yeah. you want. Yeah. Punchlines at the top. That's right. Van Lera says something very interesting about the implications of this narrative for those who read reviews. He says, when reading online reviews, you should consider what the reviewer's state of mind was, where and when their experience took place, how emotions flow across the review, mm -hmm. and where the climax is. In that way, you consider who is writing the texts and what their helpfulness really is. Mm -hmm. So I usually, I mean, uh, to kind of uh, describe this, I usually jump directly to the negative reviews. Because okay. if somebody likes something, well, that, that's awesome, but yeah. I want to know why didn't you like it? Mm -hmm. And usually, very often, those this, this place was, was awful, you know, the manager was rude. Right, but very often you will see a narrative mm -hmm. that kind of describes, you know, I showed up, you know, the you know the person who met me at the counter was really rude, uh, you know, my my room wasn't made up, you know, and they they tell this whole story, you know, I got there with my wife at you know you know five o'clock in the evening and blah blah blah, and they tell this story, mm -hmm. and in that story you can tell is this just a person who's normally a crank. Because a lot of times you get you can tell this is just sure. a cranky old person, sure. right? You yeah. see it all the time, cranky old person. Um, but other times you can see it's thought out, and you can tell sometimes usually where there is a legitimate beef with what happened. And understanding that, you understand the context of their story. Mm -hmm. It gives you a better feel for why this place may have gotten a negative review, and is that or is that not important to you? Right. Right. And you know, there, there's a subtext here that, that Van Lair is not talking about, which I, I thought about when I read this piece, is, is this idea of the value of this narrative and the story, especially for the good reviews, negative reviews, no, in this context I'm going to say, but yeah. uh, for the good reviews in particular, it's why you're starting to see professionals write these reviews, <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. you don't know that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but, but you know, PR agents for these companies are often going out to Yelp and TripAdvisor and these places, and they're writing them. They're not really right. users. Right, right. They know how to create a narrative. They know exactly what you're talking about, that, that, that pyramid of information that you're looking for. They know the punchline. They know how to make it a narrative really emotionally hit. So there's some of that going on here, too, where oh, yeah. the really well-written ones, especially the real, well, obviously all the really good written good ones, many of them are written by but professionals. But you, you can almost tell those, though, they're because too they're, too, they're too good, they're too <laughs> slick. Yeah. They're too slick, right? Yeah. yeah. I, actually, one review I saw was, it was about a, a hotel on the outskirts of, of uh, Santa Rosa, and it, all, it was almost all negative reviews, and the words that, that came up most often was <laughs> prostitutes, <laughs> Gang bangers, meth lab, wow, <laughs> bed bugs, and there was even like somebody had submitted a picture. It was like, yep, it was their arm, and their arm is like completely covered with bites. Jeez, <laughs> like, wow. Yeah, I guess I won't be staying there. I think I stayed in that place. <laughs> Did, didn't I? That didn't, sounds I awesome. didn't I send you guys to that place to do a video did. shoot once? Mo I think I, I motel five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, that's that. But you know that that's really gets to the psychology of, of how you motivate people to take an action or not, and that, yeah. that goes to the heart of quality. Too. Hey Dirk, we've got a minute. Do you want to do an off script? Do you want sure. to save it? Right. Well, go for it, I was yeah. going to ask you uh, about Halloween coming up next week. Oh, awesome! Um, but I couldn't think of a suitably scary question, so instead I'm going to ask you a question about a topic that should be scary enough for anyone. Politics. Oh, geez. Right there. Oh man. We have a whole minute. Right <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> so the election's coming up in ten days. Oh right. Okay, about ten days. Um, so. Do you think, I mean, really what's going to change here most likely along with some, some, uh, some gubernatorial races is probably the House of Representatives. Okay. So do you think uh, that, for instance, a, a change in that, Democrats controlling the House, is going to change the way that 
maybe the government treats things like trade policy, which is going to affect U.S. manufacturing. I mean, certainly the tariffs that have been put in place have, I think, in net so far seems to have maybe helped some U.S. manufacturers a little bit. Maybe. We don't know long term. But if the, if the House flips to the Democrats, it's going to be a lot harder for the administration to get stuff like that done. Is that going to be a good thing or is that going to be a bad thing long term, do you think, for industry? I don't know. And, and this is, I mean, I'm not a person who follows politics mm -hmm. really close like, like you do. But my sense is that almost anything that happens, which is, is, is wide ranging, you know, whether, it's, whether it's the president's uh, tax cuts, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's tariffs, I don't think you really know the impact of those for a dozen years. Okay. Ten years, you know, eight years, right? I, I don't think you know it because these things take a while to have. We've got a huge economy, mm -hmm. so what do tar well? You know, tariffs have short-term effects, mm -hmm. but they also have long-term effects. Tax cuts have short-term effects. Yeah. My, I'm going to pay fewer taxes this year. I'm going. Well, that's kind of awesome. Yeah. But what's the effect of that? Yeah. If, if, I'm, if I'm paying fewer taxes, if you're paying fewer taxes, that's less, less money going into taxes. Which, well, which, what effect does that have on infrastructure and so forth? So tell deficit, the truth, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you're right. I mean, the, the tax thing on the supply side, they always talk about supply side economics. On the supply side, it takes a long time many times for that to work its way through. So yeah, it could be several years. It could be even when Trump's not in office anymore, maybe right. where we see the, re the effects of that. Um, I, I mean, for me, I tend to agree with you. I think that if the Democrats were to take over the House of Representatives, I think you will see a big change in some of these policies. I think that's why you're seeing uh, the administration really trying to push through a lot of things quickly if they can, because it is going to change. I think there's going to be a lot more oversight, uh, and I'm not going to editorialize on whether that's good or bad, but um, there's going to be changes, I think, if, there, if the Democrats were to take over the House. So I don't know. It, it's really, I mean, they're favored to, but who knows? I mean, when election day comes, the polls are go out the window, so we'll see what, what happens when we actually vote. Yeah. All I want to see is that somehow or another, we all just get along. Get along. <laughs> well, that's just, probably not going to happen, Dirk. Sorry. Not in Sorry. my lifetime. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that is it for today's Quality Digest Live. Thank you all, too, for joining uh, us. Thanks and to Barb Clary. Barb Clary, yes, yeah, yes. an amazing career, a fantastic woman. Uh, uh, she and her, her late husband, um, uh, Mark Clary, uh, Mike. Mike Clary. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote for us a lot, a lot of great articles from him. Good company. Um, so I really appreciate Barb coming on the show with us today. So uh, from all of us here at Quality Digest, you all have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye.